The year is 1877. A young man has been working hard at his medical studies for nearly a year now at Edinburgh Medical School in Scotland. His name is Arthur Conan Doyle, and he is about to meet Dr. Joseph Bell, the man who will later become the inspiration for none other than a Mr. Sherlock Holmes himself. Joseph Bell, Mr. Doyle's professor in medicine, offers the young Mr. Doyle to become his clerk in the infirmary. And though Doyle is initially skeptical of the man, he soon realizes that there is something truly special about Bell and his methods. Fast forward some 10 years to 1887, when A Study in Scarlet is published by the Strand Magazine and one of literature's most famous characters makes his first appearance, Sherlock Holmes, who was inspired by Joseph Bell's own medical accomplishments. His methods of observation translating to paper. What caused such a major change in Arthur Conan Doyle's opinions? He saw, over the course of his training under Joseph Bell, that there was much left to be desired in the investigative field, and so too invented a character that used the same methods, albeit romanticized greatly, as his former teacher, Joseph Bell. Well, first of all, about the Sherlock Holmes stories, they came about in this way. I was quite a, a young doctor at the time. I'd had, of course, a scientific training, and uh, I used occasionally to read detective stories. It always annoyed me how in the old-fashioned detective story, the detective always seemed to get at his results, either by some sort of lucky chance or a fluke, or else it was quite unexplained how he got there. He got there, but he never gave an explanation how. Well, that didn't seem to me quite playing the game. It seemed to me that he's bound to give his reasons why he came to his conclusions. Well, once I began to think about this, I began to think of turning scientific methods, as it were, onto the work of detection. And I used, as a student, uh, to have an old professor, his name was Bell, who was extraordinarily quick at deductive work. He would look at the patient, he would hardly allow the patient to open his mouth, but he would make his diagnosis of the disease and also very often of the patient's nationality and occupation and other points entirely by his part of observation. So naturally I thought to myself, well, if a scientific man like Bell was to come into the detective business, he wouldn't do these things by chance. He'd get the thing by building it up scientifically. So, having once conceived that line of thought, uh, you can well imagine that I had, as it were, a new idea of the detective and one which it interested me to work out. Bell applied observation and the scientific method to medicine, and Doyle felt it was necessary for someone in the field of detection to do the same. That if he was to get his man, it was necessary for him to build the case up through evidence an idea that changed the field of detection the world over. I will talk about Joseph Bell and Sherlock Holmes in future installments of this series, but it was only proper and fitting that I talk about Arthur Conan Doyle, a pioneer to deduction, in this series, in this first episode. But is he actually worth our time in this investigation? Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Arthur Conan Doyle, through his writing of Sherlock Holmes, developed his own skills of deduction to a reasonable, respectable, and impressive level. Sometime into his retirement, Doyle ended up using his powers of observation in a very similar way to Holmes himself. Two notable cases exist in which we see his methods. Shortly after the death of Arthur Conan Doyle's wife, eagerly looking for a distraction, he received a plea from one Mr. George Adalji, who was charged with animal cruelty after horses were attacked and gutted on a neighboring land. Doyle's suspicions were raised immediately when the attacks continued, even after George's imprisonment, and he was further convinced of George's inability to carry out the crimes when he realized that George's eyesight was too poor to traverse the obstacles of the fields in the dead of night. Despite this, though, the police continue to hold to their own theory, even threatening Doyle with letters to discontinue the case. Doyle remained undeterred, though, 
until George was acquitted, and systems were put in place after this case to make things easier on similarly wronged and tried individuals. A lesser-known case that Doyle worked on was the murder of Marianne Gilchrist, in which a petty criminal convicted of the murder was Oscar Slater. The police had a considerable lack of evidence in this case against Slater, and Doyle continuously disproved every theory of theirs wrong while he worked on this case. It wasn't until some time later, seven years to be exact, that it came to light that the police were actually excluding suspects in Gilchrist's own family circle, who had powerful allies in positions of power with the police. Slater, too, was acquitted of his accusations. It is important to note that Doyle by no means actually solved either of the two cases in question. It seems, rather, that Doyle was more concerned about clearing the name of innocent parties. Once this was done, Doyle didn't seem to care about following through with the rest of the case, and as such, these two cases still remain unsolved to this very day. So what can we learn from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's own methods, and what mistakes of his should we avoid making? His determination is remarkable in both instances. He was actually fighting the police on the cases in question, even continuing despite threats. True determination is what can be the driving force for a deductionist. If you're unmotivated to continue deduction, it will be hard to focus yourself to continue. As we see in the second example with Oscar Slater, it took seven years to come to its conclusion. This is because Doyle lost his determination to finish it until some time later. Also, it seems that Doyle knew his limitations. Once he reached his goal, helping wrongly convict convicted individuals to walk free, he stopped. He didn't push himself to try to catch the real bad guy something that was likely beyond his prowess. It is important to not overstep your own skills, or else you will find yourself overextending yourself and thusly jumping to conclusions. Doyle's motivation was to help innocent individuals walk away from crimes they didn't commit. What's yours?